These are three questions we can ask when we look at a, a Bible passage. What is it saying? So what? You know, what is it? How does it apply? And now what? What do we do? This passage in Luke is the only time we see this in, in the Bible, this section. There are two historical incidents that are discussed. <coughs> Jesus gives a parable. And what he's wanting us to do is recognize our sinfulness. He says to repent or perish, bear fruit or be cut down. That's the what of the passage. The so what is that recognition of our sin and separation from God is actually the first step in the gospel. <clears throat> Those who do not produce fruit, those who do not recognize their own sin and repent, are cut down. Jesus says in Revelation that he will separate the sheep from the goats in the end times. And we want to be sheep and not goats. The now what part of this, how do we apply it, is that initial repentance is, is called justification. It's our first step in a relationship with Christ. Continuing repentance is part of sanctification, and that is becoming more like Christ. It's a very long process. It never, never ends on this earth. And bearing fruit is the outward evidence of an inward change. There's a very popular former, now late, Dallas Theological Seminary professor named Howard Hendricks. He said, most of us have a built-in early warning system against spiritual change. The moment truth gets too close, too convicting, an alarm goes off, and we start to defend ourselves. Our first strategy is to rationalize sin instead of repenting of it. Our scripture today starts with two real incidents. Verse 1, there were, there, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. The Galileans would have been visiting Jerusalem and offering sacrifices in the temple. We don't have details of this incident. But it does fit Pilate's reputation. The Galileans probably credited his servants in Jerusalem. Pilate may have thought the Galileans were rebelling against Rome, so he sent his soldiers to intervene. Jesus answered in verse 2, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? We're sinners than the other Galileans. Does that kind of remind you of, of us? In ancient times, it was often assumed that unusual calamity would befall only those who were extremely sinful. I think that kind of comes through today also. The Pharisees would have said at that time that the Galileans deserved to die for rebelling against the Romans. The Pharisees were opposed to using force. To deal with Rome. The crowd, though, wanted to hear Jesus' response to the Roman slaughtering of righteous Jews as they performed their Jewish religious duty. I'm sure they were not expecting this response. Jesus, instead of blaming others, demanded repentance from the people. He said, All sinners must repent or face a fearful end. Unless you repent, you too will all perish. He may have had in mind the upcoming destruction of the city of Jerusalem in, 70, in the year 70 AD. He was speaking to individuals then and also to us today. Each of us should look to our own day of judgment. The day of judgment is promised by God and is described vividly in Revelation. Jesus then brought up another example. Eighteen killed by a falling tower. The Tower of Siloam 
was inside the southeast section <laughs> of Jerusalem's wall. It sounds like this was a recent event, and it was the talk of the town. Those killed by the tower may have been working with the Romans on an aqueduct. In verse 4, Jesus says, Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? Now the zealots who were a group of anti-Roman terrorists would have said that Galilean aqueduct workers deserved to die because they cooperated with the Romans. So we've got condemnation for rebelling, we've got condemnation for cooperating. It sounds a little bit like our politicians today. As one commentary put it, whether a person is killed in a tragic accident or miraculously survives is not a measure of righteousness. We're sinners, more guilty. There's been a comparison going on there, and we at least subconsciously think this way today. Making comparisons is natural for us. Often we come out on top, as long as we compare ourselves to the right person. But God does not grade on a curve. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fail to understand the depth of God's hatred of sin. Sin is falling short of God's holy standard. We really can't grasp what that is. Sin is rebellion against God. Sort of, at least we know what that is. Sin is natural for us. James 4.17 says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, sins. That, that hits everybody there. We can all blame some guilt. To repent is to turn from sin and toward God, to admit that we fall short. One exercise that I've heard about with the idea of repent is to face west, which is thought of as, uh, in Eastern culture, as darkness, and then face east <coughs> toward the light. So repenting is turning from the darkness to the light. Why should we repent? Well, number one, because Jesus commands it, but also to recognize that God is holy and we are not. This is the first step in salvation and in, in our relationship with God. It's also part of the process of sanctification. It shows a willingness to change. We get some good BSF notes. A couple, a couple things I pulled from, from our BSF notes include even people who are considered good by human standards fall short of God's holiness. We compare ourselves with others who are worse and then think we are good. Truth is, we are far more sinful than we believe we are. We're all born in sin and act in rebellion against our holy God. We like to believe God saved us because we're good, but the Bible tells us before salvation, we have no desire to respond to God. God has to, God has to give us the desire and the ability to respond, to repent. John Wesley called this gift Prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. Before we knew him, before we were interested, God gives us grace to, to be interested and to reach out. God reached out to us with mercy when we did not deserve it. He loved us before we loved him. We can't earn our salvation. It is a gift. We must start, though, by repenting recognizing our sin and turning toward God before we can receive the gift of salvation. We don't stop sinning in this life. That won't happen until we leave this earth. But we are free from the penalty and the power of sin here on earth because the Holy Spirit gives us the power and Jesus has paid the penalty. We will be free from the presence of sin when this life is over. Does God ever show you your sin? That is a good thing. That is the Holy Spirit calling you to make a change. 
This is part of sanctification, part of becoming more like Christ. Will you allow the Holy Spirit to help you make a change? All we have to do is ask. If you have never repented of your sins and trusted Jesus, is there any reason you have refused the merciful gift Jesus offers? The gospel can be summarized by four basic truths. The first one is the hardest. We are absolutely dependent on God, our holy creator, who has an absolute claim on us. This kind of sounds un-American, doesn't it? We are absolutely dependent on God, our holy creator, who has an absolute claim on us. The second truth is that our sin separates us from God, and we need to be reconciled <laughs> to him. The third truth, Jesus, the Son of God, took the wrath of God for our sins. He took God's wrath in our place. The sin has to be punished. He took our sins on the cross and gave us his righteousness. And that's what God sees. Isaiah 64 tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. But what Jesus gives us in replacement for our righteous acts, which are filthy rags, is his pure white robe of righteousness. Again, a free gift. Fourth, our only reasonable response for what God has done for us through Christ is faith in Christ, repentance, and drawing on God's power to live a transformed life. Christianity is not a religion. <coughs> it's a relationship. In verse 6, Jesus moves on to a parable including a fruitless fig tree. The fig tree is often symbolic, symbolic of the Jewish nation. Judgment was the only answer for fruit, fruitlessness. The farmer interceded for the tree to give it one more chance. In our case, Jesus is the farmer and he is interceding for us. Jesus implied his nation, the Jewish nation, was having its last opportunity to make good before the judgment of God would fall because of its rebellion and unproductiveness. The fig tree may also apply to the individual soul. God gives us ample opportunity to come to him. Fruit is a result of a healthy plant producing what it was designed to produce. Fruits of the Spirit are listed as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are not things that we can do on our own. Only through Christ, only through the Holy Spirit are we able to show any of these fruits. Jesus said, Abide in me, I am the vine. Without me, you can do nothing. God has given us ample time to repent and bear fruit. Eventually, judgment will come. Our world is in the same boat as Israel. Jesus will return like a thief in the night, he said. The final judgment will be like, unlike anything we've ever seen. If you haven't read Revelation lately, give it a read. It's, it's rather scary. Jesus calls us to repent and bear fruit. Some of that fruit might be talking to others about whether they've read Revelation, have they read the end of the book, read the end of the story. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a pretty picture, and yet the, the picture for believers, those who trust Christ, is totally beautiful and mind-blowing and more than we can even imagine. Where is God calling you and me to improve our fruitfulness? First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have an initial repentance, which is at the time that we trust Christ. And then we have continuing confession of sin every day because we're not going to get it right in this life. God allows us to confess our sin, dust ourselves off, and continue in our quest to serve him. We won't live our lives perfectly, 
that when we get to heaven, we will see Jesus. And he says we will be like him. Then we will be free from the presence of sin. God's grace is greater than all our sin. Praise be to God. Our closing hymn is number 365, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.